she she read one part of uh, uh, the Zui Monkey where um, Dogen he said something about uh, not really just accepting the words of the ancients and the patriarchs, although he always tells us to follow the examples of the great patriarchs, he was he gave one example of one boy who told uh, an, a, a, a patriarch who asked him about the color of the grass and then he asked about the other guy and so there was one teacher criticizing this um, uh, this answer and Dogen said no you you should also not always accept what the ancients said you should also think for yourself so I think this is also with uh, Dogen's tradition uh, this of uh, trying to really keep something alive not just to trying to follow although he really I think there is a really heavy emphasis emphasis on uh, following the tradition and, and the examples because they're really important but also make something alive otherwise it's just dead uh, and the next point uh, I would like to comment is in the, in the next paragraph um, the director cultivates Dharma decorum so that the, the dignified manners that have deteriorated will begin to flourish and then in the end of the paragraph he says uh, if the quorum is not actually displayed the way becomes non-essential when the quorum is not displayed what is not the quorum is called is called the quorum when the way is known essential essential what is not the way is called the way so at, again here at first I was a little bit uh, confused or startled because this word the quorum sounds like a uh, very weird to me sounds something like etiquette like uh, behave behaving in a kind of uh, elitist again way or something i don't know this word sounds a little bit weird to me but then i i started to to think more and more what he, he meant here and uh and and then uh, reading the introduction of the of this book the the Ehei Shingi there is the translator Daniel Layton again uh, in the introduction he he says how uh, in this book Dogen is focusing on the importance of uh, monastic practice all aspects of everyday life not only Zazen and uh, he said that in, in the time of Dogen there were some disciples of his that came from the Daruma Zen school. Uh, according to Daniel Leighton, this Daruma school was like a little bit of an earlier version of Zen that was a little bit immature according to him. It was before uh, I think the, the first version or how Zen kind of started in Japan. And Many guys from this uh, Daruma school, they came with the idea that a, a just um, a intellectual understanding was enough. So for them, just knowing that every one of us is a Buddha was kind of enough. You, don't, you really didn't need to practice it or to have that uh, monastic routine. And, uh, and Dogen was really harsh on these guys, according to Daniel Leighton, especially in some text of the Shobogenzu. And this guy, this, uh, the translator, uh, he he compares these guys from the Daruma school with uh, many people who talk about Zen today many, many people from his country, from the United States who, who see as enough just having this kind of like uh, maybe some spiritual understanding or some spiritual awakening and uh, uh, you don't really need to practice it or monastic practice is irrelevant so he compares these guys that were coming to Dogen to some movements in our own time and he talks about uh, the beatniks who were kind of like the grandfathers of the hippies the beatniks were maybe a group, uh, group of artists from the 1950s in the United States who 
wrote also about Buddhism, but before they didn't have actually any contact with any uh, Buddhist tradition. They were just reading some books and talking about it. So he compares these two sides. And uh, uh, in this case, I, I, I'm going to give you now a personal example uh, that uh, at first might sound a little bit way off from what is Dogen is saying here, but I hopefully in the end we will agree that it's related. So Kandasan in a campfire last year, he asked me, so Murilo, how did you come to be interested in Buddhism? And at that time, I wasn't able to give like a clear cut uh, answer to him. I said some random things, but I was really not able to give him uh, like a, a very clear answer as he gave me. He just gave me like a very short story. It was very simple but very meaningful. It was it was very clear. But at that at that time I was not able to to really explain to him how because I think there were many influences and many different things. But if I, then I, I thought about it uh, recently uh, while actually preparing for this talk and if I was going to give one clear answer, maybe it would be because. I had used drugs, so I think uh, the use of drugs was something that eventually brought me to be interested in Buddhism. So when I was 20 or 21 at university, I had experience with uh, the so-called magic mushrooms. And uh, this experience at that time was something that really uh, kind of changed my way of seeing the world. Before that, I was very uh, skeptical, was very totally against spiritual things. For me, it was just like a waste of time. But after that, it was such a strong experience for me that I, I started becoming more opening. And then somebody eventually lent me a book that I would never read. And, and then when I read it, it was not even about Buddhism, but it was something about meditation. But that's how it started. So I think that experience really made me to start becoming interested in uh, things related to Eastern religions. I was so interested and so fascinated by this experience that uh, I was doing... I, when I, this happened, I was in the first year of uh, journalism university. And in, until the last year of the university, we had to uh, give like a, a final project. And this final project in journalism could be like a documentary or a, a, a book of uh, telling like a, a journalistic story or something like this. And I decided to write about the history and the implications nowadays of uh, this drug, the mushrooms. Uh, and I, I, I researched about the whole history of it and to my surprise it, was, it had many uh, religious implications and cultural implications. And I, I got to one uh, research that was going on at the time, it's still going on, in the Johns Hopkins University, it's a medicine university in the United States. And they were starting to, this was 2006, and they, they were starting to make research with uh, psilocybin, which is like the active principle of the mushrooms. So they made, the first experiment they made was, I think, uh, around 30 people, and uh, for half the people, they gave uh, the, the mushroom, and to other half, they just gave a placebo. And after, they, they gave, after six hours of these people in a room with classical music, with some paintings, they gave them a questionnaire to fulfill. And they, they are actually they are following these people until today. They are checking how they are living their lives in many different ways. And these people, they are all like a health healthy adults who had never taken drugs before and who had some religious background, whichever religious background. So the, from the placebo group, the results were very different from the, the, the group that actually took the mushrooms. And one, uh, and one of the, the questionnaires they gave these people, that's why I'm bringing this topic here, was uh, based on some studies of the psychology of religion and uh, they and, and this questionnaire was supposed to measure if these people had had like a, what it's called a religious experience, a mystical or a spiritual experience or not. So I'm going to read for you 
Uh, I, I opened yesterday, the, they still have online the, the research, the results. And uh, they, so to, to make this questionnaire, they did uh, like a, uh, a long study of history of religion and, and, the, and psychology of religion especially. And they got uh, all these points that make a, a religious or a mystical or a spiritual experience. So there are a few points here that they, there, there were, in a, it was a long questionnaire, but the points are summarized here. So internal unity uh, is one of the things in this experience, a feeling of internal unity. Uh, uh, in parentheses, pure awareness emerging with ultimate reality, and then external unity, in parentheses, unity of all things, all things are alive, all is one. Next one is transcendence of time and space, ineffability and paradoxicality, claim of difficulty in describing the experience in words, sense of sacredness, awe, noetic quality, claim of intuitive knowledge of ultimate reality and finally a deeply felt positive mood joy peace and love uh, so so yeah these people who actually had the the mushrooms they they had like high marks in this these uh, mystical things and the people who didn't have they didn't have these marks and also the people who had the experience they compared the, the the meaning of this experience as to the birth of a first child of the death or of a parent so it was something very strong and the research they were doing this research because they were interested like in therapeutic uh, uses of uh, this substance so for example they're they're doing this today they're giving these uh, mushrooms to people who are terminal pa pa patients of, for example, they're dying of cancer. So they have this experience and maybe they will die more peaceful, peacefully because they, they feel that death is more relative or something like this. But anyway, I'm just giving you all this example here because I think uh, people who come to Zen today, many times they have this background similar to the one I have. Uh, even like, uh, for, for instance, uh, Alan Watts, he, he was, he's considered, together with T.D. Suzuki, one of the guys who popularized Zen in the West. Alan Watts, he wrote the famous book, uh, The Way of Zen, there are many copies in the library. So Alan Watts, he, he was uh, taking mushrooms too. He, there was, in the early 1960s, there was a, a, a program in Harvard University uh, to study the same thing that, that this study that I, I mentioned just now. They were studying magic mushrooms in, in different cons uh, uh, contexts. So the group of the professors, professors there was mainly led by Timoth Leary and Richard Alpert. Timoth Leary, after started experimenting with LSD, he was eventually expelled from Harvard and he became like a guru of the hippies. And Richard Alpert, he, he went to India and he became the guru Ram Das, he's still alive. And uh, Alan Watts was hanging out with these guys and also the famous writer Aldous Huxley. And they were all taking the substances and they were uh, talking about how they would change the world, they would open people's minds. Anyway, like the things didn't actually happen as they, as they planned. Like the, the, the greatest drug use in the 60s maybe didn't change people's lives in the way they predicted in a, such a positive way. But I'm just telling you all this to say that even these guys who were really responsible for making Zen very popular, they were uh, having this approach and this focus on this kind of like spiritual or uh, mystical experience. So I think that... Uh, Many people who, who come to, to Zen or come to Wantaiji, they, they have this background and, for, and they're really interested in this kind of spiritual experience. But then there's a different reality here. And I think this is what Dogen is saying exactly right now. And maybe he's saying, even he's saying this in, res in part in responsible to this Daruma, the guys from the Daruma school, but nowadays would be maybe guys like me or the beatniks or... Uh, so what, what Dogen 
so I think it's important thing is to, to think about what actually Dogen meant by decorum. Decorum, from what I interpreted, I don't see it as like just like uh, uh, doing perfect bows or making very intricate uh, rituals and ceremonies. I think uh, by decorum, I think uh, I think he means to practice wholeheartedly and in harmony with the Sangha. I think uh, by especially reading the Tenzo Kyokun, I think that's what he means by it. I think it's not an, an emphasis of like a, a very beautiful Zen etiquette of doing things very, like very complicated ceremonies. I don't think that's his meaning of the quorum. I think his meaning of the quorum is to, it's something actually very down to earth. So I think when you come with this idea of these spiritual experiences, these mystical experiences, sometimes you are very much in the mind. You are almost maybe even a bit spaced out because you, you were fascinated by this. But I think Dogen's approach and what, you, what he's uh, emphasizing here is something very down to earth. And, and for me, that's the, the most valuable thing that there is because it's very easy. And another thing why I brought this example here is because to show that it's very easy to have like a so-called uh, spiritual experience. You can have a sub, uh, mushroom and uh, you don't even need to spend years doing meditation. It's uh, something that's very accessible. But what are you going to do with that? How are you going to live your life? I think that's the main thing. If you just have some spiritual experience but continue living the same way, 